of God's animals that he made. And my memory verses, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and in holy shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. What is second full? Matthew 4, 10. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, it's for this witness. Thus thou wilt up the little I got, but who needs thou that serve? Four, four, ten. Matthew 4 verse 10 says that Jesus said unto him, Get the head, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Matthew 4 verse 10. Matthew 4 10 says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10 Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Matthew For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Matthew 4.10 Hi, my name is Joshua, and I'm four years old. And my many verses, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. And it says, Ten. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hand, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. Matthew 4 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hand, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Then, then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Matthew 14. My memory verse is Matthew 14. And it says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, That thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4, 10. My name is Malachi Brown. I am six years old. This scripture is taken from Matthew 4, 10. Then says Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Matthew 4, 10. I want to say good morning. I want to welcome you to another Children's Corner. I'm your host, Pastor Darren Tinsley. We're so glad that you're able to join us this morning. Again, we have another exciting lesson from the life of Paul as we uh, study the journeys and how God led him in many of his missionary endeavors, which is an inspiration to us who have a desire to live for Jesus. We may not be able to go on far missionary trips, but we are able to witness for Christ wherever we are by our actions, by our words, um, by uh, being able to give other people material to read. We can be witnesses for Christ right where we are. But we're grateful for these exciting missionary stories um, of what God has done in the past, which shows us what God is able to do in this present day for us. So as we prepare to go into our uh, lesson study this morning, we pray that you've enjoyed our Hidden Truth Corner, where they shared with us uh, their memory verse 
uh, for this week. And so again, we just pray that God would uh, continue to bless you and may you be inspired uh, by the uh, memorization of these young people as they send them in. So again, before we go into our lesson, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity that we've been blessed with to be able to open and to study your word. We pray that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would guide us and direct us as we study. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have another, again, as I mentioned, another uh, exciting story from the life of Paul. It's taken from Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, we see that the gospel that Paul was preaching, the gospel that the apostles were given, the commission that God had given to go into all the world, it was affecting um, not just how people live in the sense of turning them from uh, bowing down to physical idols. But it also had its effect as it turned people from the, the, the vain pleasures of this life. There's a man that is, that is highlighted in this particular story this week. His name was Demetrius. And he was a silversmith. He made shrines. He made images to uh, a goddess called uh, Diana. And he made a lot of money as a result of these uh, images that he sold. And so he profited uh, greatly from the idol pagan worship <clears throat> of the people in that particular region, Ephesus specifically. But one thing he mentions, he says that all the world worshiped Diana. So, so maybe his idols were not just sold locally. Maybe they were distributed uh, throughout the world. Maybe he had a business. Uh, maybe he had several shops in different areas and different cities. And he had a large clientele. And so this worship brought him a lot of money. And so you would understand why he would be so upset uh, with anyone who preached that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. And so we find that in this particular story of Acts 19, as Paul began to, uh, Paul and Timotheus, um, uh, as they traveled, uh, they were leading people to turn away from various idols and they were accepting Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And it began to affect the business of these idol worshipers. You know, I was in a particular island um, in the South Pacific and I remember uh, going by a shop where uh, they made uh, idols and Interesting to see these young people, um, I believe, because when I went there, uh, the, the people that were working in the back, they were, they were young people, owned by older people, but young people back there with this artistic skill and, and this attention to detail of making these particular idols that were sold as souvenirs for individuals. And one of the gentlemen who uh, was coming to the meeting, he actually managed this particular shop uh, where he had people under him working, making these idols and he would sell them. Um, but by God's grace, he eventually uh, gave it up and he realized that um, while he did not believe in these idols, that they had any life or they could do anything for anyone, um, but he did not have a desire to continue to, to sell them knowing that he was selling something that God had condemned. And so I was able to uh, see how these things were made. People making them don't, don't really believe in them, but it brings in particular money. This is how they take care of themselves. And so it wasn't an easy thing to just let this particular lifestyle go. And so one thing that it does as we read this lesson, it really teaches us to really sympathize with those who are making decisions for Christ. Because many times 
they are walking away from their livelihood and they now have to learn to trust in God in, in a way that maybe you and I have not had that experience. Maybe we grew up in the church. Maybe we always knew about the Sabbath. But there are people who are learning about the Sabbath for the first time, and their entire life was centered around their work. And now they're being told that this day is God's. All days are God's, but God has specially carved out a particular day in which we will, that he calls for us to worship him. And as they begin to see light in this particular truth, they say, yes, I want to keep the Sabbath. And they go into their boss and they say, you know what? You know, because of my conviction and my acceptance of Jesus Christ, I realize that God has taught in his word that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. And so from this day forth, I choose to honor God by worshiping on the Sabbath. And I will no longer be able to uh, participate in working on these particular days. And their boss looks at them and says, well, we're sorry. If you can't work on Saturday, then we're going to have to let you go. And this person has to make a decision. They have to decide, are they going to follow God or are they going to continue to work in violation of the principles of God's Sabbath? That's not an easy decision. And sometimes we look at people wrestling with that decision and we almost encourage them, which is the right thing to do, but we don't take into consideration that they have bills to pay. Not that we should not share the truth with them, but that we should also be sympathetic to the needs that they have and begin to realize what can we do to help in this period where they are receiving no income. And a lot of times we're quick to share the truth, but we drag our feet when it comes time to actually help people monetarily uh, to sustain themselves while they are able to recover from this loss. And so as we look at Acts chapter 19, we want to see what happened in Ephesus as Paul, as the gospel made its way into Ephesus. Now let's begin in Acts chapter 19, Acts the 19th chapter, and we want to begin in verse Mm, 24. Acts 19, verse 24. The Bible says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, you know how, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Verse 28, And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath. They cried out, saying, Great is, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So here you find this man, Demetrius, persuading the people. And what did he do? He said, Listen, if we don't deal with this man, Paul, we are going to lose our money. If we don't stop this man from preaching, if we don't hold the people, then we are going to lose our wealth. And when these people looked and they said, man, I don't want to lose my wealth. I don't want to lose my home. I don't want to lose uh, 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 all the prestige that has come as a result of this. And they worshiped 
their finances more than they worship God. Because it wasn't about the temple so much and the worship of Diana that they were concerned with. The very first thing he brought up was, man, you're going to lose your money. And how many people today are more concerned with their finances than they are with serving God? There was a memory verse we learned this week. You heard the young people recite it. And that is that we should have no other that the Lord thy God, him only, shall we worship. And yet you find people today, they worship their cars, sports, um, um, their jobs. And it's, it's, it's not just the job, it's everything that the job has brought. The, the, the comfort, the comforts of life. Maybe this person was poor their whole life and all of a sudden now they finally got, got, a, uh, got a breakthrough and got a good job and now all of a sudden they're able to provide for their children things that they didn't, themselves never had. And now they're being confronted with the idea of losing it all. And Satan tempts many people to believe that by serving God, they're going to lose. And so many young people as well are tempted to think that if they serve God, they lose. There are, there, there are multitudes of young people who will not accept the truth of God because it's just an inconvenient day. If it was any other day, they would serve God. If they could uh, uh, um, go to church any other day other than the day that they play football, play basketball, any other day in which they have uh, opportunity to do what they want to do, they would serve God. But they believe that it's too, it would cost them too much to serve God. And so these men in Paul's time thought the same thing, and they stirred the people up against Paul. Now, the interesting thing is, if you were in the city of Ephesus at that time, what would you have done? Would you have pulled down your flag, as it were, and tried to hide and make people believe that you were not a Christian? See, because maybe, maybe at this time, up until this time, the Christians were able to go back and forth. They were able to be out in the public. They were to be able to be out in, in, in uh, uh, letting people know that they were Christians. But now all of a sudden, the city is stirred up. The city has been led, the people are being led to believe that the Christians are going to take away something from them that Jesus has come to rob them of something. And these Christians are the result of that. And so brothers and sisters, what would you have done? What would you have done if you have gone to school and all of a sudden the teacher begins to talk about how bad Christians are and, and some of the things that they, they, they have done and, and, and begin to highlight their abuses and their mistakes would you be silent? Would you say, you know what? I'm not telling anyone I'm a Christian anymore. What would, you, what would you have done? Well, let's see what the Christians did in that particular city. The Bible says, going on, so as they come together and they, uh, they got the whole city riled up against uh, Paul and the gospel, and not only them, but anyone who professed this gospel, they got them riled up. And then it says, uh, as they gathered all the people together, it says, beginning in verse 29, and the whole city was filled with confusion and have caught and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companion in travel, they rushed with one accord into the, into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in, um, entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And a certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. 
Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. But they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews, putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is the goddess, great is Diana of Ephesians. So what did Alexander do? Was he here? Was he... Um, uh, were these people there? Were they going to uh, stand up and declare that they were the people of God? Or were they going to remain silent? And this is the decision, brothers and sisters, that we are often confronted with. Are we going to remain true to God? Or will we take a stand? Are we going to continue to proclaim the gospel? Or are we going to be silent when persecution comes against us? And so, brothers and sisters, as we look at this particular lesson, the Lord teaches us that it is him only that we are to worship and to serve, that we are not to put our faith and confidence even in the very things that God has blessed us with. The Bible tells us that God has given us strength to get well. The jobs we have, praise the Lord, that we're able to provide for our families. The, the, the material things, the warmth, the heat. You know, here in America, uh, it is starting to get um, uh, very cold. In some places it's actually snowing. And so we're grateful for the heat that we're able to have. And we're able to have this heat because we're able to have jobs where we're able to purchase electricity and all of these things that we're able to provide. But what happens, brothers and sisters, when the day comes, when man says to us that they will no longer accept us because of who we worship, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna, are we gonna give in because of the luxuries that we've been able to enjoy in this life? Or are we gonna remain faithful to God? So as we look at these missionary stories, and we see what Paul went through and what others went through, we have to pray and say, Lord, strengthen me. Lord, help me to be faithful to you now so that when these days shall come, that I will be able to draw upon your strength because I have made Christ my refuge. Brothers and sisters, again, we want to be encouraged as we read these stories, because truly there are many Demetriuses today. There are many things that are being set on foot where those who preach the gospel are going to be seen as the reasons for financial woes in the land. May we be found faithful doing the things that God has called us to do now in the days in which we live. Let's be faithful and let's continue to pray and be an encouragement for each other. So until then, brothers and sisters, until we're able to fellowship one more time, may God richly bless you and be encouraged.